Guys, I'm so excited to have David Ravenhill on again. And my heart has drank from his personal relationship with God and the wisdom and understanding God has given to him. So today we have that great opportunity of doing that again. Thank you so much for coming on. Good to be with you. Before I get into the questions I have for you, I wanted to see if there's anything that's been on your heart that you'd like to share with our viewers. Well, I mean, uh, you know, on a personal level, I've just had uh, my uh, left knee uh, surgery uh, where they replace the uh, uh, the left knee mechanism, if you like. So uh, I'm getting over that. So that's uh, sort of consumed me the last two or three weeks and uh, keeps me awake at night for the wrong reasons. But uh, apart from that, no, I, um, you know, uh, on a spiritual level, just concerned about the nation and the way uh, things are going. You know, it just uh, looks like we're, unless God intervenes, we're heading for a major, major disaster. You know, the nation is no longer uh, recognizable as a godly nation. We're uh, totally given over to heathenism and selfishness and lawlessness and all the things that Jesus predicted would be a sign of his uh, of his coming, you know. So uh, we're seeing those things fulfilled. I think, you know, most of us of any age, we can look back and uh, uh, remember, you know, Matthew 24, wars, rumors of wars and so on. And it was always, yes, one of these days that will uh, that will happen. But now we're right in the middle of it and we're seeing it, uh, you know, almost on a daily basis, just the, uh, the falling apart of, uh, of our nation spiritually, you know. What kind of responsibility do you feel the church has watching this happen? Well, I guess, uh, you know, part of it is our responsibility for not uh, taking the gospel as we should have to uh, to the nation and uh, praying for those in authority. You know, I mean, I, even on a personal level, um, my pastor, yes, I think it was, anyway, it was somebody yesterday, uh, the godly man that I was talking to that said, uh, yeah, it was the, the man that was sharing at church, sorry. Uh, he was saying, you know, when I think of our current president, he said, I find it very, very hard to pray for him, you know, and I think uh, a lot of people are in that uh, that boat, and yet we need to, you know, if ever a man needs God, it's our president, and uh, and yet, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's far easier to call down fire from heaven on the guy than it is to uh, really believe that God and his grace can, uh, uh, can touch him, but I, I think that's true, too, for, you know, politicians of every shape and size, that uh, we don't pray enough for kings and rulers. I mean, uh, Paul writing to Timothy said, first of all, you know, it wasn't like last of all, uh, first of all, and I think it's become last of all, if not none at all. You know, the average church, um, you know, you go to some of these mega churches, you go to a prayer, my dad always used to say, if you want to go to uh, if you go to a church on Sunday morning, you see how popular the uh, the minister is of the churches. If you go Sunday, excuse me, Sunday night, you see how popular the pastor is. If you go Wednesday night, you see how popular the Lord is. And um, you know, we don't even have Wednesday night meetings in most churches anymore. We don't even have Sunday night meetings anymore. It's uh, strictly uh, you know Sunday morning, and then when it comes to a prayer meeting, maybe a mega church, but. Uh, you know, on a prayer meeting evening, you could get them all in the janitor's closet, you know, and, and there's still room. So, you know, we, we haven't prayed as we, we should, for sure. And uh, I think as a result of that, you know, uh, you have not because you ask not, you know. Wow. We haven't sufficiently covered the nation in prayer. Wow. Um, powerful and sobering uh, truths you bring up. Uh, the, the questions that I had for you are, are on a sobering nature as well. Yeah. Your book, uh, The Jesus Letters, right. one of many, I think it's now called For God's Sake, Listen Up. Or is that what? For God's Sake, Listen. Uh -huh. Yeah, For God's Sake, Listen. Uh, it, I had some thoughts from here that I wanted to ask you. You write here in the first part, you say, we find the Lord clearly speaking of symptoms of spiritual ailments, misunderstandings, sins, laxities, failings, even heretical teachings, which seem always to have plagued the body of Christ and which still plague the church today. Moreover, the spiritual medicines we find recommended in these letters are as good for us today as those many centuries ago. Do you, do you have any general thoughts concerning these letters that Jesus writes to the church? 
Yeah, I, I think we've, uh, you know, we've laid them aside and uh, everybody wants to know what God is saying to the church, you know, these days, especially if you have some sort of a prophetic ministry. And yet the last thing that God said to the church in a, in a very clear, indisputable way was uh, his letter to seven churches. And I've, uh, I've always said, you know, why do we neglect, uh, you know, in other words, we're looking for a, um, a current word for the church and yet here is a very clear word that was given to the church the last word which are always uh, the most important and yet we we tend to put them aside wanting to hear from some prophetic voice about you know something that's going to happen some catastrophe or whatever and so on and we neglect uh, uh, the seven uh, churches I, i've always said this is uh, uh, what you have in the seven churches is god's uh, sort of value uh, value system of the church in other words, there's not one commendation uh, for size in all of the seven churches. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, the church that was supposedly alive, Jesus said, is dead. The church that was rich is poor. The church that was poor uh, financially in every other way was rich. So, you know, you've got God's way of, uh, uh, of uh, looking at things. And I, I think we need to take heed that, uh, you know, the final exam, uh, we have the examiner. And we have, uh, if you like, a uh, a copy of what the exam will be like. You know, I think I used that. It's, it's so long ago now since I've uh, looked at uh, what I wrote. But uh, I think I used the analogy of uh, somebody uh, wanting to, say, get a, uh, a pilot's license for a small plane. And uh, they've struggled. And somebody comes along and said, listen, I can tell you exactly what the exam is going to be like. And you say, really? You say, yeah. I mean, well, is it legal? Yeah, it's it's legal. And in fact, I've got a copy of some of the questions. Not only that, but I can introduce you to the guy that's going to be giving you the test. You know, I mean, you'd be a fool not to say, listen, I'd love to meet the guy and I'd love to see what the exam is all about. And, and really, the seven churches, I think, is the exam. You know, what God is looking for. He's looking for a church that preaches holiness and not a sort of a... Uh, you know, grace message that allows sin, which I, I believe is the, uh, you know, the, the Jezebel spirit really was a, uh, it was a, a message that allowed, I don't think she was standing in the pulpit saying, listen, you can sleep around and do what you want. Mm -hmm. But I think the fruit of her message was that you can get by with sin, which is a greasy grace message, you know. And I think we've got to take heed of that because uh, that judgment is coming. And, and uh, uh, especially as leaders, we've got a responsibility to, um, you know, walk in a way of uh, before God, a, a way of integrity, and uh, uh, and not be concerned about what man thinks or man's uh, uh, evaluation. It's uh, you know, walk. Be God said to Abraham, "Walk before me, and be blameless." You know, and uh, I think we've got to walk before Him. He's uh, he's the uh, the one that's going to give the final exam, so to speak. I have with me another one of your books here. Uh, the right. God, yeah, the the God, of, mm. the God of Grace is not the grace of God. Um, for the people that are watching, if they want to grab a hold and see more of what you said on that subject concerning hyper grace or that Jezebel spirit, as you were saying, um, to take a microscope and look in at one of the churches, Ephesus, uh, you talk about how first love is what they've fallen from. Obviously, that's what the scripture says. But you describe first love here as first love is measured by priority, intensity, quality, and purity. And then you, on another page, you say it like this. Jesus remembers a time when their relationship was alive with fervor, feeling, and passion. Hours together seemed like minutes. Everything else paled in importance to being together. Do you have any thoughts on this first love? Well, I mean, you know, you can uh, you can take uh, take the uh, the message to the Ephesians, and if you leave that section out, you know, they get an A plus almost. You know, I know your zeal, I know your toil. I mean, you know, who wouldn't want to have a church that uh, every member, if you like, if you group them all together, is uh, is zealous for the things of God. They try those that are apostles and are not. In other words, they're squeaky clean, um, uh, doctrinally. And, and then he sort of drops that bombshell at the end, really. But I have this against you. You've lost your first love. And I, I think, you know, the, the one uh, 
the one analogy we have in the Bible, as, as far as our Christian life is concerned, is that of marriage. Yeah. And uh, I, I can't think of anything worse than uh, a husband that's, uh, you know, lost uh, the, the love for his wife. He, he may be a great provider. He may provide her with a mansion and a Mercedes to ride around with the most uh, beautiful clothes and jewelry and everything else. But uh, if there's no love relationship there, you know, it's uh, it's tragic. And uh you know, I, I I tell people my my wife and I met in a, a small Bible school in uh, Minneapolis, and it was a, a strong sort of a holiness message, even though they were uh, believed in the uh, baptism of the spirit and things of the spirit and so on. But uh, the uh, the first year of school, you were not allowed to date. The second year, you could date, but you could only go off campus uh, once a month, <laughs> and uh, and you uh, you had to. Um, go to the uh, the dean's office and you had to put your name in a book and uh, you would put down who you were taking out and then you had to put in what time you got in that evening and we had a curfew of 10 30. and so if you were late consistently they could give you uh demerits and you could actually be asked to leave the school but um you know that was always something that we chafed at. You know, ten thirty. I mean, it's so early. You know, we're 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 out here with the the girl that we love, or the the guy that we're dating, or whatever the case may be. And then one day we came up with a revelation. I still think it was a revelation <laughs> that um, that the day begins at midnight. And uh, so we got together. We used to double date with another couple, and uh, we agreed to meet at six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and by uh, by seven thirty, we were way up. Uh, we were in Minneapolis uh, area. We were way way up near a place called Gooseberry Falls, and uh, you know, having breakfast in some restaurant while everybody else, basically back at the uh, Bible College, was still getting up. And so, from six o'clock in the morning till uh, ten thirty at night was a pretty good date. <laughs> but they also had another rule in that school, and that was that you had to get up early. Uh, at a given time and have a devotional time before breakfast. And they had monitors in the uh, girls' dormitory and the guys' dormitory that would make sure everybody was up. There was a quiet time where you were uh, supposed to be praying and seeking the Lord. Well, I happened to be um, uh, uh, not, not restricted by that because my uh, father, even though he was not on staff, we had staff accommodation. And so I didn't have a monitor that made sure that I was up at a particular time and invariably, I would sleep in, and I would miss that devotional time, but I would never miss breakfast. <laughs> and I tell people, I said, uh, you know, I, I think one was a legal relationship I had with God. The other was a love relationship that I had with my girlfriend. And I, I think there's a lot of Christians that have a legal relationship. Do I have to read the Bible? Do I have to pray? Do I have to do this? Do I have to do that? But when you're in love, you know, if my girlfriend had said, let's get up at four o'clock in the morning, <laughs> I had been uh, out of bed at four o'clock and ready to go. But when it came to getting out of bed at four o'clock in the morning, for, for God's sake, if you like, uh, that was a totally different story. Now, hopefully that's changed over the years. And my love for God, <laughs> you know, is, uh, is greater than uh, the the alarm clock. But, uh, but I, I think, you know, that's the tragedy that uh, the message that... Uh, Jesus gave or the Spirit gave to the uh, Laodicean Leado, church, you've left your first love, not lost it. Mm -hmm. And I say there's a difference between losing and leaving. Mm -hmm. One is uh, volitional and one is, uh, you know, one is uh, purposeful. Um, I got that mixed up. But anyway, I, I, I use the illustration. If you, you know, if you, uh, if you went to the, uh, ball at Christmas time with a couple of little kids in tow and uh, you've got a three-year-old and a five-year-old and the, the three-year-old wanders off you get uh, fixated on something in the shop window and all of a sudden you turn around and your little three-year-old is gone you go into panic mode and you uh, you know go to the first person you can make an announcement listen there's a little three-year-old wandering around with red trousers on and you know a, a red hoodie or whatever you know, if you if you see that little one, please bring that little one to such and such a place. You know, you've uh, uh, you've uh, lost your three year old. On the other hand, if you go to the mall with your three year old at Christmas time to leave your three year old, uh, obviously you're going to get arrested if they find out your motivation. And uh, and I think there's a lot of people that they've uh, they've lost 
uh, oh, sorry, they've left the first love rather than lost the first love. You know, they've mm -hmm. got distracted with all sorts of other things that have come in and uh, they don't make room for the Lord the way they should. That's you right here. An incredible little uh, analogy. You say, uh, the intensity of first love cannot be measured by numbers or programs, nor can it be valued by budgets or buildings. We deceive ourselves if we look at a marriage as being great based solely on the size of the house, the spouse's income, or the size of the family. None of these visible assets reveal the love the couple shares together, right in line with what you're saying. Can you give us maybe a couple of practical examples of things that we often get distracted with and also some practical examples of like tending to our first love? Well, I mean, I think the whole Christian life in a sense of disciplines of the Christian life, you know, can take over and we can do it in a, in a, out of routine rather than out of relationship. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a passage of scripture I go back to many times in uh, Luke chapter 16. Just read my Bible here. I think it's uh, maybe it's 17. Uh, but it's the, um, it talks about which of you having a slave tending or plowing sheep. Um, here we go. Which of you having a slave plowing a tending sheep will say to him when he comes in from the field, come immediately and sit down to eat? Will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat, properly clothe yourself and serve me until I've eaten and drunk and afterwards you can eat and drink? Mm -hmm. He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded him, does he? So you too, when you've done all the things which you commanded, you say we were unworthy slaves who've only done that which we ought to have done. But going back to verse seven, it says, which of you having a slave Plowing or tending sheep. I think there's two aspects of ministry. One is the uh, the tending of the sheep. That's the the shepherding, uh, the pastoring, the teaching, the feeding, and so on. The other side is uh, the plowing the fields. That's the evangelism of breaking up the fallow ground, going out into the community. You know, praying, interceding uh, for the uh, region where you live or the nation, and so on and so forth. And uh, so you're serving your master. And at the end of the day, you come in and you're weary, you're tired, you've been looking after your master's sheep, you've been plowing in your master's field, you're exhausted, maybe it's the heat of the day, maybe it's the, the cold of the day. And the last thing you want to do is, uh, or, the, or the first thing you want to do rather is uh, go in and uh, clean up and, uh, and sit down and have a meal and, you know, turn on the news or whatever. And uh, your master meets you at the door and he says, where are you going? You say, well, you know, I've been out looking after your sheep all day and uh, plowing your fields and uh, he has the audacity if you like to say to you well what about my needs <laughs> you know and you could very easily say listen i've been looking after your sheep your field your this your that and uh, i think worship you know that's what real worship is it's ministering to him my dad used to quote a man by the name of uh, robert murray mcshane a famous uh, older uh, man of god and he said uh, uh I'm trying to think how it went now. No amount of activity in the king's service will make up for the neglect of the king himself. And I think so often, you know, we can get caught up in the king's service, serving God, you know, uh, counseling, preaching, preparing messages, visiting the sick and all of that. And it's all good, but we can neglect the king in the process. And, uh, and I think the first love, again, is maintaining that a priority, you know, and that in all things he might have preeminence. Mm. And uh, I think that's the challenge for all of us, myself included, you know, that does he have preeminence or is he sort of second fiddle? Or, you know, when I get round to it, then I'll I'll spend a little bit more time in worship and, and so on. <laughs> I, that quote that you said, no amount of activity in the king's service will make up for the neglect of the king. That is worth, I think, a whole semester in Bible college. <laughs> Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Here's another one that you say here. I think this one's from G. Campbell Morgan. You wrote down, first love is the abandonment of all for a love that has abandoned all, all mm -hmm. zeal for the master that is not the outcome of love is worthless. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a, a strong statement, but it's beautiful to see yeah. the preeminence. Yeah. 
of Jesus Christ. Uh, Why don't we end by saying this? There's people watching, mothers, there's fathers, student college students, there's evangelists, there's ministers watching. Uh, We have a large audience and wide variety. If you could give them an exhortation of some kind towards first love, what, how, what, what would you say? Let's just, let's just give that to you and let you just kind of take it from there. You know, I worked with a gentleman for 15 years in New Zealand, very godly man. He's going to be with the Lord now. And um, we had a big church, big church by New Zealand standards at that time. It grew to about 2,000. And he never came into the office. He, uh, he maintained a little office in his house, which was literally about three miles from the church. But every once in a while, the phone would ring and uh, uh, the secretary would say, Brother Peter is on the line. And I'd pick up the phone and say, David, you have time for a milkshake today. I'm coming into town. Mm -hmm. And uh, milkshake was code for getting together, you know, having tea, coffee or just meeting. And he would knock on my office door. We'd go down four floors. on. We had a big old theater building and we'd find a coffee shop somewhere. And somewhere in the course of that uh, time together, he would uh, he would always ask me, you know, how's your marriage? And uh, you couldn't give him a pat answer like, oh, fine, you know, things are good. You know, he'd point his finger at you a little bit and say, come on, tell me the truth. How, how are things really going? And you ended up spilling the beans because he, he was a genuine father figure that you knew he was really interested in you and nothing else, you know. But somewhere, and this happened uh, over the 15 years, this happened numerous times. He would look at me and say, David, remember, I don't ever want you coming into the church office until I know you've spent at least an hour on your face before God. And he understood that, uh, you know, fruitfulness comes out of relationship, just as it does in the natural. You and I are here because of, uh, you know, some sort of intimacy, uh, hopefully good, but uh, nevertheless, you know, it comes out of intimacy. And the, the same thing is true spiritually. You know, or my dad used to say, you're only as good as your prayer life. You're only as good as uh, the God that you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, the only way you can really know God is to spend time with him. You know, I uh, I have a good friend by the name of Winky Prattney. You may know uh, Winky. But uh, many, many years ago now, possibly 35, uh, 40 years ago, we were outside of a youth of a mission base. And uh, he was... Um, he was uh, saying to me, uh, he'd been away for a while, and uh, he said, David, have you ever noticed this verse? He took me to Mark, I think it's uh, the fourth chapter, where Jesus came down from the mountain and chose his disciples. And it says, he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. And uh, Winky looked at me and said, David, you realize the first thing that Jesus did, he appointed 12 to be with him. And he said, uh, he looked me right in the eye and said, we have no right to go out to preach mm. unless we've spent time with him. You know, and, uh, you know, I would say to any any leader, you know, the product, if you like, if I can use a crude expression, the product we're selling is the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> but you can't describe that product unless you've been with him. Uh, First John begins, the epistle of John, you know, that which we've seen, that which we've heard, that which our hands have handled, and so on, I make known to you. In other words, I know what he sounds like, I, I know what he feels like, I've been around him, I can describe him, and so on, you know. Uh, and they knew the product that they were selling. And uh, and we've got to know that. We've got to know the holiness of God, the integrity of God, the love of God, you know, the mercy of God. I mean that that's our message, and if we if we haven't spent time with him, then obviously this uh, our message is going to be is going to be defective. Man, I really feel the Lord as you're saying those things. Would you would you please just pray for us, those that are all watching? Yeah. Father, you know exactly who is watching this right now. Lord, not only do you know them, but you know them intimately, Lord. You know everything about them. And Father, I just pray that, Lord, you would place within them a hunger, a fresh hunger for the things of God, Lord, those that have lost the first love. Lord, whether through neglect or sin or whatever it is, that, Lord, that you are a God that restores the years, the locusts and the cankerworm of Edom. And I pray, Lord, for that one that has 
wandered away, that, Lord, even now, Lord, you would bring them back, give them hope. Lord, for the one that is just uh, going through a difficult time, Lord, that they've become weary in well-doing, that, Lord, you would refresh them in your presence, Lord. Get them alone, Lord. Somehow make them uh, uh, time available to them, Lord, where they can get alone in your presence and know that season of refreshing again, Lord, where you would pour in the oil and the wine, as it were, and that, Lord, they would have a new, uh, a fresh wind to keep running the race, I pray, Lord. Father, give them the revelation that they need, Lord, especially those that are ministering, Lord. The word shepherd means to feed, and I pray, Lord, that, Lord, as they feed upon your word, that, Lord, you would feed them, and in turn, Lord, they'd be able to feed others and see a body raised up that would truly glorify and magnify your name. In Jesus' name, amen.